So I would ask the, the, the panelists, we have four panelists uh, to come down. Uh, if you see your name, come down. If you're surprised, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, come down anyway. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All right, I have... <clears throat> I, uh, there is a QR code uh, by which people can uh, submit questions. Um, I think that's working. Um, and uh, this last session uh, is called Understanding Accessibility and Socio-Spatial Disparities with big, uh, Mobile Big Data. Uh, I was uh, given instructions that we should come up with questions beforehand, so I've shared these with uh, the panelists. Uh, also, because I know academics, uh, I gave them instructions to try to keep their answer to less than a, uh, less than a minute. Uh, I'm hoping we might have some more interaction with uh, the audience as well, both through, uh, through these kinds of questions or if uh, someone, um, someone has uh, a response to what people have said to, uh, to the questions I'm asking, uh, please, you know, I, I, I like these to be more sort of, I think panels are, are nice to be more interactive. And this is, this is the last panel. This is where we're trying to sort of figure out what we've all learned from this conference. So if you have some ideas or something you'd like to say, you know, wave. It's kind of hard because the lights are kind of bright and I might not see you. So um, wave or shout out as well. So um, I don't think I'm going to do the introductions uh, since uh, I think every, uh, that, well, everyone's name is up there. Um, and I probably, I might sit down at some point, uh, <laughs> but I don't know. <clears throat> but the first question I put to the panelists, and are you all okay with just going like this and maybe go back and forth? Or do you want to do a different way? Okay, just to let you know, we're going to start with you on the Ooh. first question, and then we'll <laughs> go back and forth. So. I don't want to be anticipating it. So the, the, the question I prompted to them, uh, there was like four questions. Two were big, uh, focused on research. Uh, two were really focused on sort of practice and policy. Um, so, you know, so really uh, we have a nice, nice really collection of expertise, uh, research expertise, uh, policy expertise as well in this panel. Um, so the first question is, uh, what are novel res research foci data sources or methodological approaches in mobility research that you've seen recently, perhaps here at Mobile Tart too. There's been a lot of interesting stuff here. Um, how do you see this impacting uh, future research? So. Yes, thank you. So I was thinking about this question and yeah, my idea is nothing like novel or, or new, it's quite old, but I still uh, see it very relevant. So. What I've been thinking, and also it comes up in every session or discussion, is that uh, how to really integrate uh, mobile big data, like uh, big quantitative data and small qualitative data. Because I think we are already very good in studying patterns and trends using this uh, quantitative data, but how to actually really answer the question why, who, uh, what are the perceptions? What are the experiences? What is the meaning? So I think there is still plenty of room to advance towards this, although I see also studies already doing that. So yeah, something, something to maybe have in the next mobile data session, like a mixed methods approach session or something. Ah, okay, right. thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for the que question. And um, I actually agree with Curly. The, um, I think there's been a move from focusing on, here's my data set, I'm going to do the whole project based on this one data set towards how can we combine multiple data sets? And that's been a really positive advancement um, that encourages multidisciplinary uh, disciplinarity. So I think that's, that's something that I've seen in terms of novel stuff that I've seen and, and interesting directions of travel, I think just rather than being descriptive and explaining the data sets, like doing new things with data. So there's a, there's a lot about uh, mobile telephone uh, derived data sets, CDR data sets. It's really good to see the emphasis on what can we do with that? Like Henrique's talk on how can we use this to inform decarbonisation pathways? Now, that's something really interesting that, that shows the value of the data sets rather than asking more kind of theoretical questions. 
Um, obviously, there's been the talk about AI, but one thing that I noticed with that is I don't recall any single concrete feasible research proposal based on using large language models in transport. Like, there's a lot of kind of very hypothetical ideas. So I'm going to um, pitch my own not new idea, but one that I'm quite excited about, which is um, linked to the idea of multidisciplinarity is making more links with the um, ecologists, because there's amazing uh, movement models and kind of home range analysis and activity space research going on in um, the, the space of ecology. Unlike humans, they are not subject to GDPR, so you can get individual level data super easily from a whole range of different species. And there's just amazing work going on by computational ecologists and other um, ecological models. So that's, that's a, an idea that I've had for a while, always wanted to do something in that space, but I'd say that's one big idea that um, I'd like to see more of at Next Mobile Tati. As I am the representative of uh, local government, I'm going to really practical side. Uh, when it comes to dealing with um, data, uh, the trend right now for the municipalities is to use them for modeling or um, acting some kind of processes uh, to visualize what will be when these changes are going to be. But uh, what the problem is that uh, when the data is collected or uh, different um, things are put together, we end up with the problems using the data, for example, the, the GDP, uh, you know, the yeah, GDPR uh, problems, or the problem that our team or public government uh, uh, workers cannot um, understand the data uh, because they don't have the knowledge for that. And that's why we always have to, 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 to you guys, to researchers, it's, it's not a bad thing. But yeah, what I'm trying to say is the, uh, the trend is to the modeling uh, uh, way. Uh, this is the, I think, quite practical way for the local municipalities to use the data uh, because it, it makes the, all the different systems quite easily understandable. But still, there are standing the problem of uh, uh, when we get the data, uh, then we will see uh, that sometimes all the aspects are not usable for us. Uh, the data is not taking account some real practical things from like when it comes to, in my field, uh, city planning. Uh, we have the data, but we have to take into account different uh, aspects. So it's a big, big mix of it. So the trends is to towards uh, modeling. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you gave me the floor, right, for 15 minutes. So I will start with uh, <laughs> one monologue answering all the questions at once. No. <laughs> um, uh, there are several things I, I, I noticed uh, at, at Tartu, but also in, uh, in, in the broader aspect is that um, I think I, I, I have a, a lot of hope on the data spaces and development in terms of how much data we have and how much data we can share as a community uh, in, in, the, in, in the triple helix. And that if we are capable of getting that solved, but, and not only as a marketplace, because then we're still selling data, but actually sharing data, uh, that could be uh, an enormous profit or valuable for, for at least the scientific world to, to have a lot of added value for practice. So that's one. Uh, the other thing is that um, uh, actually we're uh, facing uh, a, 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 the coming decades a, a huge challenge in terms of what was coming towards us in terms of climate change. Um, I see a, a change of mitigation towards far more adaptation that we're still, we have to deal with it a certain way. Uh, but on the other hand, we're, we're pressing on mobility transition and also energy transition, et cetera, et cetera, but we're not making the real next steps. So it's all kind of incremental. So I'm hoping that at next Mobile Tartu, uh, there will be some really nice presentations of um, people showing a real transitional disruptions in our, in our, in our field. I'm just going to say I'm not actually texting. Uh, I'm not taking my notes <laughs> on my phone. I just want to be, be, be clear both for the panelists and for everyone here. 
uh, as I see me typing on here. Um, um, we have uh, some time, you know, if people want to talk about it, I might just sort of summarize what I've, some of the things I've heard is like, I think there's like a real sort of interest in multidisciplinarity, uh, sort of mixed methods, you know, maybe having some sort of mixed methods sort of workshop at the next mobile TART 2. Um, also some really interesting ideas in terms of how do we actually put this, you know, put this stuff to work, you know, using AI, maybe uh, pulling in some eco uh, e uh, ecological models, uh, you know, uh, uh, range and other sort of things for animal species. Um, but also then this, you know, this last real and, you know, you know, real sort of pressing issue of dealing with climate change and the extent to which, uh, you know, changes in mobility policies um, can, uh, can, can uh, help, help society move towards that. But anyone else have something they, they saw in particular in terms of a methods or a data set or something they think is worth shouting out beyond this? You are all very quiet. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Well, I, 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 you might have more time to talk now. Uh, I was thinking we'd have uh, more sort of interaction. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I, st I still have hope in them. Uh, no questions yet. Uh, at least that I can see. Maybe I'm not looking at that right. Okay. So the second kind of question, um, and in some ways we've sort of uh, breached this already. Um, what kind of uh, interdisciplinary collaborations would you like to see uh, within mobility research or using mobile big data? And we're going to start on this end and go back this way. I, I once heard that if you want to have interaction, you, you, you just have to give a wrong answer. You know, so maybe people <laughs> don't say it. It's well, everyone, you've all given the right answer so far. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest you guys aren't giving good answers. Ah, uh, OK. okay. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think the, the, the whole context of, uh, of digital twinning and the challenges we're facing in which there is far more interaction between all kinds of disciplines um, ask for uh, far more collaboration over domains. Um, uh, so we need far more better how the one domain influences the other domain and how their inter-domain inter models have to be estimated and used. So there's a, a huge challenge in the, in the next coming years to, to actually um, develop those, uh, those, those models. Um, and one important aspect, and this is actually, I think it's also a really old aspect, is that we're talking about a lot about behavior and a lot about data trying to see how people behave, but it's always based on uh, revealed behavior. So people have done stuff. Uh, and how they react now. And you know that all kind of, I'm mean, more in the transit modeling business, that we actually use estimated uh, choice models based on yeah, sometimes stated preference, but also a lot of revealed data. Um, uh, and we all know that the behavioral models are quite of constant taken to the, towards the future. Um, uh, so we actually need a lot of effort in getting far more better behavioral models, trying to estimate um, uh, how people will react um, if we are going for some kind of disruptions in the in our system. Yeah, and when you have these uh, models, we want to know the information. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, for local governments, the um, working together with universities is extremely important, especially in those topics, uh, because uh, we might think what people want and how they behave, but as you said, uh, we need a real information about that, and uh, this also gives us the credibility, uh, uh, also in the political level, to to bring up the new uh, new problems and new solutions for them. Because in 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 some sense, these climate issues are not um, maybe acceptable, or people don't even some of them even don't even believe in them. Uh, but but the facts and and the uh, cooperation with uh, with universities and the different science, scientists can, can really help us out. And I'm really, really glad that uh, in Tartu with Tartu University and other universities, uh, I think we have a really, really good cooperation and, uh, and we will do it uh, further also. So yeah. Uh, in short, what I want to say is that um, the interdisciplinarity comes uh, putting together different uh, sectors, also entrepreneurs, of course, we cannot forget them. And uh, we really, really need the help of uh, scientists and universities for that. Um, so, I mean, not, not a huge amount. 
<laughs> <laughs> Not a huge amount more to, to add. I said um, I'm interested in um, more links with ecologists. Like a lot of it seems to be focused on the social sciences, but um, there's a whole load of disciplines, including biology and ecology. And I think that's linked to a broader point of increasing the scientific rigor of our work so that when we're presenting it to governments and others, um, they, they can see the rigor underlying it. And I, I think that idea of transport being more scientifically um, rigorous it, it is definitely something I'd like to see more of. Um, in terms of disciplinarity, I actually think um, every, like this has been a very good conference for that. Um, in the PhD school, we had a, a talk by someone who was part of the um, Estonian government, uh, Christian, and we've also had representatives from industry here. So I actually think this is a really good mix. Um, and it's clearly like, you don't have to be specific about putting people in disciplinary boxes. Like the main thing is that it's got an open-minded attitude towards different um, research areas. And I think that's, um, that's really good. One idea that I did want to pick up on uh, was from one of the keynotes yesterday by Anu. And in one of her slides, she talked about um, a, a paper that I, uh, as far as I remember, she did a paper where she um, involved Syrian refugees in the design of an algorithm to um, locate them. And I just thought that is such a cool idea because usually algorithm development and methods development is done by a very, very narrow group of people. Um, computer scientists, I guess some, some of the people in the room will be doing it. Um, and I think sometimes there's a slightly elitist attitude that, oh, we know how to develop the algorithm. We'll, we'll put it in a nice, friendly language for, for mere mortals, for, for everyday people. But what would happen if you actually opened that up and said, well, we trust you as people to understand the algorithm. Can you help inform us? And instead of developing it behind closed doors, do it as a collaborative algorithm development. So that's not my idea, that's our news. I, I would love to see something like that in future events. Yes, and I have to say that I agree with everything that was already said here. And yeah, uh, hard to add anything very <laughs> interesting here, but I really like the idea that Robin said that the collaboration with ecologists, because I have also been checking their papers and have been amazed how, how advanced they are also with like mobility and activities-based studies and super much to learn from them. Um, and uh, as my research topic is more like segregation and social spatial inequalities, then I see that also like uh, collaboration still more with uh, sociologists, for example, uh, behavioral studies. So uh, this is very, very important. When I started doing my segregation stuff uh, using mobile phone data, then definitely I didn't have that strong theoretical linkages with those long-standing traditional theories of segregation and actually like uh, doing um, these studies together with for example population geographers this has helped so much and this has helped so much also to communicate the results and findings to other uh, sociologists or population geographers so they can really can, uh, make linkages between our maybe novel approaches and their more traditional approaches. And I think this is very important to advance the, um, to ask the right questions and also advance the theories that have been kind of developed for a hundred years maybe. So this is super uh, important. And if I have time, then I would also continue uh, that uh, what Kertu said that, um, um, Yes, collaboration with policymakers. Also, like just from my own experience, that uh, um, like just having a discussion with policymakers, it's already very useful, especially when there are like new novel approaches. But even more, I have understood that you have to kind of start discussions or collaboration already before 
you commence the study, so when you design the study, so that you actually know that you really ask, uh, ask the questions that are rele relevant for policy making, and even if the approaches are new or the results are new, somehow they can integrate their like, long-standing long policy frameworks, those, those results. So I think this is very important to start those collaborations early, not just presenting yeah. the results. Yeah. yeah, just to add to you that there is one, one more aspect. Maybe in some topics, the policymakers don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. So if you start as early as possible, it takes it, it gives them time to 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 get familiar with it and uh, maybe even make it as their own idea a bit. Mm -hmm. So this is also a really important thing. Great. Um, I actually, so I'm trying to, I'm like reading multiple things here at the same time, trying to, you know, trying to integrate this. I'm, I'm actually going to sort of jump off script and take a question. I know. Ah. I'm sorry. I know. I, I, I promised I wouldn't, but yeah. But, I, but I, thought, I thought there was a really nice question that came in right now um, that built on some of this right now, which, and the question is, do you have any thoughts on how we might integrate big data into participatory research? Because uh, I think that was actually one of the, I mean, lots of interesting things came out here in terms of better behavioral models, but also this idea of how do we, you know, make this less, less of sort of a, a, you know, elite set of people in whatever room making decisions, but having more integration with, you know, the people who are going to be affected or the city, city planners or the city officials are going to be working with that. So I'm going to toss that out and sound like, Lou, you look like mm. you have an answer. So <laughs> I'll let you. <laughs> yeah, um, I've, I've got a. Uh, one word, not quite one, one word answer, but one word comes to mind. And it was actually one of, the quest one of the answers to the quiz yesterday. And I haven't heard this word much in the conference, which is hackathon. So hackathon can be so many different things, so many different formats. And um, I think that can help kind of break down the barrier between technical people and technical work doing data science and then other disciplines. So um, when you're doing data science, um, it depends who you are and how you work, but typically you're just in a room on your own with a computer and you're getting into the zone and you're, you're doing um, the, the programming and data science. And it's not really a social activity, but in a hackathon, you're doing that surrounded by people. And that's a really good space to bring in other people. So um, hackathons don't just need to be technical and they don't need to be exclusively for programmers. So one way of, of doing that is to organize a hackathon where you have technical people and then you have people who are just there to provide ideas. And then you could have like this real time solutions development where people are kind of developing web applications, data science workflows, and then people who are more like ideas people who are users of transport systems or whatever who are providing input. So the hackathon could be a really good platform to help address that, I think. Yeah, we have used it in Tartu. Uh, a few years ago, we did a uh, city space or open space hackathon, or the ideas uh, should be connected with that. And uh, I agree that this is a really, really interesting way to, to bring together those who want to develop something and the really end users. But what we have also done is using this uh, people's assembly format. I know, are you familiar with it, but the idea is that uh, random selection of people uh, from the city citizens uh, are event invented, uh, uh, not invented, but invited to, to come to, uh, to these uh, seminars, but all the um, ideas that they will uh, speak out uh, will be um, uh, validated with uh, the field uh, experts. So uh, this gives also those uh, people from the streets, uh, new information and creates a new uh, engagement practices. Yeah. yeah two, two, two additions is that um, uh, we see a, a development in that we are more and more working on democratizing data. So getting it more uh, 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 useful for people with less uh, skills to actually uh, handle this big data. Uh, which is one step towards that people can understand what it is and what it tells you. And another development which is more and more actually uh, going on is, is quick scan modeling, which offers you the opportunity to also just ask civilians, what do you want? 
in, in, in a setting in which you have like a, a really fast model telling you that if you're going that direction, that will be the consequences. Um, uh, this, these kind of uh, uh, developments will help more in uh, participation, but uh, um, I think there's still a lot to do actually there. Just one uh, thought to add. Uh, if you want to engage uh, normal people, people from the streets, you have to make this data and the presentation of this data really, really easy. So it's easily understandable uh, because otherwise they will be disappointed uh, because maybe they don't have the knowledge. And, uh, and, and this is also one thing I think uh, local governments are really... Uh, it's a problem for us. We cannot uh, do really well explaining uh, difficult things in an easier way. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think this is like some great responses. I'm glad that question came in. I will just sort of remind everyone that on the question for that the for the hackathon, I think the last line said seven percent effective. Uh, so <laughs> not not you know I, I, I kind of feel like I'm the one like reigning on the parade, even though at the same time I want to say yes I think it's a good idea. But I mean uh, part of it is I'm not crazy about the term hackathon. There's I mean it's sort of public planning or what you called it uh, citizens assembly. Yeah, I think those because also because hackathons. I think at least from my, my experience or my take on them, it seems like something you go in for like a day or two, you solve it and you go away and there's no sort of follow up. And that's usually sort of the, the, the tricky bit. So, so something along those lines, there's also you know, participatory planning, there's participatory GIS, there's a whole sort of a scholarly tradition and things like that that could be brought into this as well. So I think that could be really interesting. Um, all right, looking at the time, we're gonna move on to our third question. I think we start here again, right? Well, okay. well, well we could skip and make, you know, no, no, we'll just do, you know, we'll keep it simple. Okay, so we're shifting from the research kind of questions into practice, though actually that last whole conversation was all about practice, so you all are anticipating. Um, and yeah, maybe we've already answered this question, but I'm gonna put it out again, because um, you know, people probably have something to say uh, beyond what's been said before. Um, how might we leverage mobile research and analysis, perhaps from Mobile TAR2, what, from what we've seen here today or th this week, uh, for practical strategies that address things like mobility justice, social spatial disparities, or climate change? Um, there's been lots of interesting pre presentations on that. Um, and then, what are some of the actual challenges? Uh, what are some of the challenges of actually doing this? So, I'll turn it over. Um, yeah, I, I think I already kind of partly <laughs> replied to this question or used my answer to discuss it earlier. But um, yeah, again, like building on my own uh, experience, so or also what I've seen here in mobile data. So I think there are some fields of research or the like fields of mobility studies that are already quite well feeding into policy make, making for I don't know for example um, transport planning for example uh, but there are also some fields that I see that there is such a big gap still between like policy making and the research that we do and how to really kind of integrate our results and and kind of inform policy making. So if I'm thinking about uh, again about my segregation research and social spatial inequalities research, so this has been very, very difficult because the kind of policy making is so much already settled in those residential neighborhoods and the new approaches of like taking into account like segregation over activity spaces uh, over mobility is so difficult to kind of integrate those two views on segregation. And then, then again, it's, it's super important to start early with collaborating with policymakers to understand how they see or what questions they have and what indicators they use. And, and for example, if I think about my last study, so I started with different, like totally different approach. And when I first uh, presented my results, they kind of didn't buy it. So, and then afterwards, when we discussed, I totally changed my strategy or approach just to kind of align it with their thinking. And for me, it maybe didn't feel that 
novel at first, but then I understood that, that that's much more like um, like practice oriented and useful for policy making, and we have to do those compromises sometimes. So really, really important to like try to come together in thinking. Yeah. So I think I've got two two broad um, thoughts on the question of of how can we direct mobile, and I think that that refers to kind of mobile phone generated data towards tackling these important questions of inequalities and um, climate change. So the, the first one is, I think it's worth framing that within the broader question of how do you make your research have any impact at all? Because let's be honest, a lot of research is just in a bit of an ivory tower. It results in a paper, other academics read it, and then it doesn't go go down to have real world impact. So the first thing to say is like, how can you make your research have any impact at all? And also be aware and honest about your sphere of influence. Like sometimes academics, and this was definitely me when I was doing my PhD, I was like writing about stuff and I was like <laughs> imagining that I had superpowers and that everyone's gonna instantly implement my recommendations <laughs> in a PhD that probably five people ever read. <laughs> so be, clear about what your sphere of influence is be honest and you know most people don't have a direct link to um the you know the local politicians let alone the kind of head of the world bank and and, and all these people so i think if you can be much more accurate in mapping out the the sphere of influence that you have and possible pathways to impact um that will help and maybe sometimes that means being less ambitious so um, possibly for some researchers, rather than saying, oh, this is my plan to solve all the world's problems, and then it doesn't work out. Um, if you say, well, this is my idea for slightly influencing a policy in a city um, that I know about, maybe that they'll be more effective. So um, that's, that's my first comment on how to, how to have impact. My second one is just to re-emphasize the importance of reproducibility because it an openness so if no one can see your research let alone run run the analysis then it's kind of hard to have impact so i just kind of re-emphasize that although reproducibility is good and it's a good end in its own right seeing that open science as a pathway to impact is a, is the second thing I, i'd say on that and then my second broad comment is actually just emphasizing what luke said about the need to have broader range of scenarios in, in the research. So because it's based on observational data, the models tend to be quite incrementalist. So they're like, here's our OD matrix, what happens if we have a 10% shift? But I think it would be great to see more research along the lines of what happens if we have a total lockdown of the kind that we had unexpectedly due to COVID, um, but to, as an emergency measure to tackle climate change. And there is a recently started research project in Leeds called Infuse that's about imagining car-free cities. So let's be a bit bolder about the, um, about the scenarios that we're thinking about. So again, that's just emphasizing um, Luke's idea. I'm going to repeat myself uh, about to go operation. And I want to add that uh, uh, in the local municipality side, Probably it's not only for Tartu, it's for all the municipalities in Estonia. We are really, really happy if you are writing about us or about our problems. Uh, of course, those problems are not only uh, for us important, they will be replicated probably in, in other places. But we really want to know about those researches. Uh, we know we tend to know more when we are included, for example, in a focus group interviews or something like that. But uh, we cannot get all the all the papers that you guys are writing or, or doing. And also, I encourage you to, to contact us uh, if you have some research questions, you want to test it, you want to ask, is it important for the municipality? And, uh, and I know that our... Uh, other department is going to launch uh, soon uh, this kind of program test in Dartu. This is mainly for startups or for the entrepreneurs. If you want to test your idea, you can uh, come talk to us. We have a uh, like a 
description what you have to do, uh, but in my mind, it, it's the same with uh, ideas from uh, from university sites that uh, we, we are really, really open. I can promise at least I am. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, really nice uh, because I, when, I, when I hear that question, I thought, well, often the technology or the, or the knowledge is not the real issue. So it's, uh, it's about the willingness and it's about the organization of stuff. And, and, uh, and if an organization is, is, is willing to transition towards uh, and, and to embrace something. So uh, often we see, at least I have to speak for the Netherlands, we see a lot of pilots in which we try, for, uh, we try everything and then it's done and then it's okay. We're finished, back to the old business. Um, and so we're not thinking of how can we uh, and make it uh, uh, lasting in terms of how, what does it mean for the, for the, for the organization. Um, and how can we make sure that we keep continuing and trying to move for, uh, further? And there are a lot of, um, at least in the in the data uh, and, and, the, and the, uh, the information which is used for decision making, um, there's a, a lot of things which are fixed. Actually, the way the whole program every year runs in terms of what data is needed to to, to report to the EU to to make certain decisions and. We are really uh, afraid of having like a trend uh, 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 which is uh, which uh, which is going to break because we have an innovative new way of looking at things and no, we don't want that. So innovation is is some some somehow it's um, it's it's not always embraced. Although we actually know rationally that it's uh, it, it would be an improvement, it would be better. So it would be really nice if we could have uh, to break those fences uh, in the in the future to to make uh, forward steps. I think that would be nice. <coughs> Any sorry. <laughs> Just taking notes here. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not texting. I'm not texting. I promise. I mean, I just like. I, 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 it's funny. I feel very uncomfortable doing my phone. I, but my, my, my laptop battery is dead, so I have to use this. Um, any? I mean, I, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in from uh, the the audience uh, in terms of this conversation as well at this point. I have some questions here, but thoughts as well. Okay. You just, you know, you can... There's you, one hand. Oh, we do. I didn't see the hand. Mm. <laughs> Whoever, okay, please. Okay, so basically I'm a social scientist. So, and I will come... My question is related to this multidisciplinary uh, aspect. And the one that Robin actually highlighted that in the future it's, it should be like kind of this combination of social scientist and computer scientist. So, um, and even like in my research, I've seen that kind of the, the way of how we trained, like computer science, their view, their attitudes, uh, and compared with social science, it's a little bit different on how we approach things. So, and also I think in research uh, has, has been showing that, uh, specifically in terms of algorithmic biases, uh, for computer scientists, kind of, okay, but yeah, we, we have the data, we can have this model and we can run the model. But then for the social scientists, yeah, okay, but what does this mean then for, like, in terms of the impact? So and my question is basically, what do you think in terms of how computer scientists or data scientists are trained to? Does it also lead to kind of this mobility and justice then in the future? Let's say we build a, a model that probably can lead to any discriminatory results due to the lack of data or not representative data. I, mean, I, I can say a few words to that. Um, firstly, yes, I, I fully agree this is an issue. And I think research culture is, is what we're talking about. And um, I, I remember Henrique again, he, he was talking about, he's in the school, he, he's in like the faculty of engineering but he was talking about donut economics and the broader kind of social dimensions. And he, he kind of said some of, them, some of the students who come from an engineering background, it just falls on deaf ears. They're, they're, they, they're like, what are you talking about? This isn't engineering, but indeed it is. Um, in terms of my own journey, like I see myself as a data scientist, but I, I'm actually a geographer by training. And I remember doing kind of cultural geography and it teaches you to be super open-minded to ideas and perhaps the way engineering is set up is it, it kind of teaches you to focus very very much on a problem and this is why some of these software engineers are so productive because they're just so focused on solving one problem uh, so I do think it, there's a there's an issue there and I think 
there would be huge benefits in terms of training people developing these these solutions to think outside the box and um, there's multiple ways of doing it whether you call it a hackathon workshop or changing the um, engineering syllabus to include some of these social dimensions I think all of those are possible um, partial solutions but as everyone knows cultural change takes time but I think the steps that can be taken by people setting up these courses um, to move in a positive direction. Does, does anyone else want to respond to? Hmm. No? No okay. real uh, additions, no. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn my head away in case someone else raises their hand because we have one more question in about 20 minutes. So uh, I want to do this. And this is, in some ways, this is like the biggest question from this panel um, is, it's sort of, in, in, in very short terms, it's what's next. But more, more formally, what kind of practical action um, can we take uh, until the next Mobile TAR 2? One of the things that's really nice about Mobile TAR 2 is rather than every year, it's every two years. And two years is enough to actually do something. So, I mean, what, what, what do you, well, first of all, everyone's going to commit to coming back to Mobile TAR 2, <laughs> obviously. But what do you want to, uh, what would you suggest that we do? I mean, you know, for example, is there something that from the, 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 the city of Tartu that would be a really interesting set of problems or sort of a questions, you know, but also from everyone else as well? So, uh, good yeah, I think uh, as I wasn't here for the previous days, it's really hard for me to, uh, to answer that. But uh, uh, hopefully uh, next time uh, more of my colleagues will be here uh, because, as I said before, we have the problem that we cannot ask uh, uh, as, a, um, as a local uh, government, we have to be smart, a smart uh, to, to, to know what we want and what we want to order, for, for example. Uh, that's why we need our people to be more uh, up-to-date uh, with, with all these new, uh, new trends. Um, but uh, what I also want to add is that maybe we could um, be together with you when you are preparing the program uh, to, to maybe add some uh, uh, local government uh, issues issues there uh, because probably they are not important only for us but for other the same size municipalities so yeah this is my <laughs> input for now mm -hmm. great other folks we're doing it randomly it's good. oh randomly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, come and, on that's uh, like the hill, hill no concepts um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when I got the question and uh, I was actually listening to the the opening because I was sitting in a bus uh, from Tallinn and uh, Christina was talking and she said um, uh, something like in, in, the, in the sense of um, trying to be part of the positive future, right? So she, she, she made, she addressed that and, uh, it, it, and I thought that was, a, that was a really nice message and also is in sync with what my first answer was that we need actually some disruptions. We need new narratives in, in how we would like to uh, organize and how we would like to see how mobility is part of the whole system and um, uh, so uh, to, to add something you, you said Robin uh, as in a reaction to my I, I actually asked a student last uh, to 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 see to look at uh, mobility budgets I told uh, I told them what if we allow people to have like a co2 budget mm -hmm. a year and uh, use that uh, uh, and to see what happens and uh, actually you think, well, it's, a, it's an easy question. And, and he came back and, well, it's not possible because uh, this and that, and there are, there are borders in which people are going to, to do. I'm not asking you to, to, to take care of all those limitations. I'm asking you to, to look at a new narrative and if we can learn from that, if we try to, uh, to, to take away those borders to, to reach uh, that new narrative, so how can we uh, uh, apply that? So. This, is, uh, this would be really nice if we have like, new narratives next time, which we can discuss which would be the, the best directions for uh, the mobility system to, uh, to, 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 uh, to go for. Awesome response. And you've helped me think of <laughs> an answer uh, <laughs> while you were speaking. So yeah, I, I think I can take that further. And a challenge to everyone is um, in a couple of years time, if you can come back with 
an idea or a piece of research that is compatible with a positive future. And I think five years ago, I probably would have said a 1.5 degrees C uh, target, but I'm not going to say that now because according to the latest science, that's probably unlikely to happen. So let's say a 2.5 or 3 degrees C um, future where we have rapid decarbonisation, um, try and add a scenario to your model that would be compatible with that positive future that I think everyone's looking for. That would be my challenge. That's a big ask. I've also got smaller ask as well. So um, a much more immediate thing, uh, and this is actually how I learned a lot of my uh, programming and, and know-how, is actually talking to people. So um, on the other side of, of the equation, so if you consider yourself a technical person, try explaining it to someone who's who's like le less on the technical side, not interested in the data side, and and actually try and like see if they're interested. Are you interested in learning this particular bit of know-how? Would you like to make some nice visualizations of data and just share that know-how? And likewise, it takes two to tango. So if you don't see yourself as a technical person. Um, show curiosity in the data work, being like, what are you doing? How are you generating that maps? What's going on? That's a black box. Just uh, find someone who is doing this um, technical work, and that will really help to break down those barriers. And I think multidisciplinary is a very big academic word. You can just call it collaboration. Um, so <laughs> that's a challenge that I pose to everyone. I think is eminently doable. Everyone can do that. Yeah, and if I continue from that, then I wrote down, um, actually it was on the first day, and Yuka Chris uh, told about that we are all in our academic bubble. So just calling to break those bubbles, which kind of continues the thoughts we already had here. So academic bubble, disciplinary bubble. So coming out from those bubble or trying, at least of course we re remain always <laughs> in, a, in our bubble to some extent. And if um, really taking this forward within those next two years and coming back and sharing our experiences, maybe how to, to really affect, like in an effective manner in a, a collaboration with uh, local governments, ministries, what are the best ways? Because of course, we as researchers, we also have like, like myriads of tasks and often the question is, that we don't want to collaborate, but it's just a question of time or finding the good ways how to do it in an effective way so that it makes sense. Uh, so maybe sh just sharing those experiences um, would be very beneficial. And also like really thinking about this disciplinary bubble and how to break this and how to bring those different disciplines, social sciences, sociologists, uh, data sciences together and have like those nice examples of research already where we integrate those different approaches. We already have them here as well, but maybe giving uh, more focus on this and discussing about the good, like nice ways and how to go forward with that. I think this was, I had one idea more or thought that I think still that Anu, anu uh, yesterday raised was that hopefully in 10 years we don't have to talk about data access, but this is a, like a huge topic <laughs> and uh, unfortunately I think in two years we definitely have to discuss it still and I hope something like good, 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 um, developments are like from the perspective of researchers still happen within the next two years and not like negative trends. <laughs> yeah. um, I might just add, you know, sort of some of the some of the things that sort of struck me from this conversation is, you know, it could be something as, you know, simple, but I think really interesting if everyone said, okay, here's an example where there is this sort of collaboration or this sort of interdisciplinary. This is something I know where you know, it worked well, or actually it didn't work so well, but, you know, just, you know, sort of bringing that together, because, I mean, I can think off the top of my head a couple of examples, but just seeing what other people, you know, what other people might see, uh, particularly their own reaction to it, like, you know, why they, you know, someone might think, oh, that worked really well, someone else will be like, no, that was a failure, but having that kind of perspectives uh, as well. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, a question that 
sort of builds off you know sort of the data point you came up uh, just came up on. Um, you know, and sort of also talks about sort of next steps about um, you know how might we uh, advance access to data relevant to uh, mobility research together, sort of a collective kind of thing. Um, instead of everyone sort of doing these individual efforts, you know, could you know the mobile TART2 community be a platform for this? You know, you know, or you know the community or someone else who wants to step up or things like that. So. I mean, I think I can I can say something on that. I think often the, there's a saying in data science that data preparation is 80% of the work, which is unfortunately true. And uh, maybe a, an, in academic work, it's kind of seen as dirty work. You just put it under the, you sweep it under the carpet and don't talk about that horrible time that you had to do the data <laughs> cleaning. And then you focus on the nice, shiny results. Um, so you, there could be a session on, um, talking about data cleaning, <laughs> this like not so glamorous part of the research process. And that could simply be as simple as having one of the work PhD workshop sessions on practical data cleaning. Um, and then another idea is like um, a data focus. So people talking about what they did with data and then making that data available for other people to use. So I think um, that's one way of addressing it. I think it is a really hard problem that kind of needs E level, EU level, um, and national level um, solutions and conversations. So bringing those people into the conversation and really being publicly supportive of the government organizations that are leading the way in open data. So being a bit of a supportive voice uh, for the people who are progressing in that area, a couple of ideas that I've got. Yeah, I, I've got some hopes that uh, the data space development will will help us in the, in this sense. But I think we have all have to put pressure on avoiding that it becomes like uh, the marketplace I was also referring to. So that's uh, at least it should be uh, available for research in a certain way, um, and also that research will have a platform to validate actually their their outcome and also share, get back again their, their outcome towards the community so they can and do the ecosystem to uh, develop further on that as well. Um, that's not a, uh, an easy conversation. Uh, we're also having that one in the Netherlands as well. Um, but I, I really hope that uh, if we all can put pressure on <laughs> those uh, involved with the data uh, spaces that at least for, uh, for, for knowledge uh, development uh, in, in, in an open uh, way uh, could be uh, it could be possible, uh, yeah. yeah. No. I mean, I'll just might just jump on. I mean, I think it's it, there's also. I mean, your point about the marketplace and having access to it, I think, is really really valid. Also, I think you had said earlier about um, having into your report, reporting requirements and sort of that. You know, making people you know sort of you know risk adverse to introducing something new because they mm -hmm. still have to deliver you know what this is. I mean, some of my own experience with trying to build out this database and this shareable thing. This is something that Ata and I have been I don't know probably close to a decade now um, been collecting Twitter data, and the original the original vision was to share it widely, um, and. Uh, ten years now, I think there's now a, a, an open data set that's now being sort of shared, um, and so the, it, it was, yeah, the sort of the expectations and hopes that we originally went for it like ran into like problems with, you know, terms of service, uh, access, you know, making sure it was anonymous, and all these other sort of questions, and just going about it. And it, it is it is a challenging, it, it can be quite a challenging thing. But it, so I think yeah, you were saying like having the EU be sort of you know part of it. It's sort of at that sort of level. Um, I see we have about four minutes left, despite what that says. Uh, mm -hmm. We're supposed to be done if, uh, at uh, 3.40. Um, and I think we've talked most of the questions, so uh, I am going to turn it over to you and see if you have any final thoughts um, that we didn't uh, talk about. I, I gave all my ammunition in my last <laughs> 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 Okay. I mean, it's it's not the most exciting, inspirational idea, but I, I so a thought that I had in some of the other conversations, especially about big data, is a lot of the time um, a problem that requires 
big data is actually requiring, it is, a, is a small data problem in disguise. So large data sets, that what you need to do with them is process them, aggregate them, get them into a, a nice format that you can actually visualize and then use it. So I think the companies who are taking CDR data, I've never seen cool data, um, cool record data level uh, information because thankfully I don't need to. Someone's taken all that data and converted it into a nice origin destination data set. You can actually take that concept further. So with the big data set from Spain we were talking about, it's provided on a daily basis. Simply providing that on an annual data, uh, on an annual basis that um, someone could easily download and make use of is a really good service to people. So doing that work of adding value to data and releasing um, the, the kind of more condensed, more perhaps more valuable uh, data is something that everyone can do to, to make it more accessible. And there's actually a benefit in terms of um, openness and, and GDPR compliance is that when you do that aggregation work, you're completely removing the individual level from it. So I think there's a lot of value in just adding a bit more onto existing data sets to make them more analysis ready, more policy relevant. So that's a, an additional idea that, that I've got on the data side. Just to add to you, I mean, previously you said that uh, maybe some huge work is done and only five people are reading it. In Estonia, we don't have this problem because you can be an influencer. Uh, you just have to talk about it. So my suggestion is that if you are doing interesting uh, work on, on, on mobile uh, data or, or big data at all, please let local governments know and uh, let's talk about it. Uh, uh, you can have a maybe new input or new vision there, but we can, can get the really practical information uh, and uh, better decisions in the future. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that because I think this is also something that is mix, is very special with Mobile Tartu because precisely because it's in Estonia and there was some conversation mm -hmm. earlier about um, you put something out but it never actually gets to policymakers or you don't have access. That's not really a problem in Estonia because pretty much someone has went to like high school with someone else who's the person you need to talk to. Um, and that's, that's, really, that's really an amazing opportunity and that's one of the things that, you know, things, ideas can get put into practice uh, relatively quickly. There's a, there's a lot of like sort of very horizontal networks here, so. But my phone says 340, and that's when we're supposed to stop. So I'm going to just uh, uh, ask for a round of applause for all our panelists. <laughs>